antivirus software can run malware on your systems. But to understand why this is possible, I'm going to have to explain a few concepts. First off, DLL sideloading and DLL search order hijacking. Now a DLL on Windows is a dynamic link library. So what that is, is some code that's being shared across different pieces of software. So for example, I have this software here, which is Notepad++. However, it has a malicious DLL next to it, which is this debug help dll so when i run it there's a pop-up that says all your base are belong to us and it shows that the dll has been executed by this particular process and if we press ok then it pops up all right it runs as normal and it spawns calculator now this is a dll that i created just for the purpose of this video and actually if i move it into this directory and run the executable again it runs as normal but we don't get the pop-up it doesn't load that dll and everything seems to be running like normal how does this work on windows there is something known as a search order now if you don't specify where a library is that you wish to load it's going to check through these different locations by default and if it finds something with that name it's going to load it now there's an inherent trust in notepad plus plus that sees this debug help dll and says this must be what we're looking for this is all good debug help dll is a legitimate windows dll it's actually sitting within the c windows system 32 directory because I have put my DLL in a location that it's looking for before this DLL, it gets executed instead of this DLL, thus running my malicious code instead of the code that it was meant to run. Now this is DLL search order hijacking. Nowadays, it might also be commonly referred to as DLL sideloading. It used to be that DLL sideloading had a little bit of a difference to DLL search order hijacking. The difference is basically that it was for DLLs sitting in C, Windows, Win S, X, S. So this is side by side. That's what it stands for, Windows side by side. So the DLLs in directories here were where the term side loading came from. You would plant a malicious DLL in one of these directories. And what Windows would do was that if there was compatibility issues or it needed a certain version of a DLL, they're all stored in here. So that's sideloading. But nowadays, sideloading can just be thought of as a malicious DLL in the same directory as a legitimate executable that is then going to be loaded. Now that we know a bit about DLL sideloading and DLL search order hijacking, let's take a look at some of the software trust where they just think they're going to find the right DLL when they execute. Now, there is a particular sample that I've located and it does have this setup.exe, but if we highlight over it, it's actually called Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection Sense CE, which is the categorization engine, I believe. And this has a malicious DLL, mpgear, DLL. But you'll notice that the description here is also Microsoft Anti-Malware Utility Library, and it seems to have the right corporation details, and it even has the right version details. In fact, if we compare these two samples side by side on VirusTotal, you'll notice something pretty interesting. On the left hand side, we have the legitimate version, which is, yep, distributed by Microsoft, no issues there. And on the right hand side, we have a malicious version. So let's look at the detection. If we look at the details, the MD5 sums don't match, neither do the SHA-1, SHA-256. This is all stuff that we would expect because the files are different. But the vhash matches, the imp hash matches because it has the same imported functions. The rich PE header matches, the SS deep, almost the SS deep almost matches. Look at the creation timestamps. Everything matches up. Look at the names associated, the signature verification details. It's the same. The difference is that this signature doesn't verify because the code has been changed and this signature does verify because the code hasn't been changed. Even if you go down to the sections, the sections and the entropy, they're almost identical. Even with the MD5s of them, the imports, the exports, almost the exact same. I've even got them side by side in PE Studio. The number of bytes is identical. The description's identical, file version, all of this because they've taken the legitimate DLL and just chopped the code in it. Let's go ahead and Take a look at this and see how it works and see what it is. So I've gone ahead and opened up both the legitimate and the malicious DLL. And on the right hand side, the malicious one, you can see that it actually takes four 
parameters. Whereas on the left hand side, the legitimate one only takes three parameters. On the left hand side, there is the, the function. So I want to explore that. So we're on the same function on both. And maybe if we just go down a bit, you will notice something of interest. This is the malicious one. This is the legitimate one. The parameter four seems to be used in this function here. Now this function is not got parameter four on the legitimate one. So let's go ahead and just take a look at that. And now if we look through these different pieces of code, there's a lot more code on the malicious one than there is on the left-hand side. Now on the left-hand side, there are calls to other functions. So you'll notice that there's calls to other functions there. But on the malicious DLL, there actually isn't any calls to other functions. And if we look, there's no outgoing references, but there are outgoing references on the legitimate one. So we actually have a case where all the malicious code is likely sitting in this function here. The rest of the code in the DLL is never going to be called. It's just going to use what's in this one. And obviously this doesn't break the executable in any particular way because it seems to still run and function. Now this malware has a couple of different components, but in general it's known as IDAT injector and IDAT loader, and this is the name given to it by Rapid7, but to other security companies it might be known as Hijack Loader. Thanks to the Rapid7 report, we know that IDAT Loader gets its name because it stores its payload in an IDAT chunk. Now an IDAT chunk is part of a PNG file. It's stuff that make up a PNG picture file. However, if we look in this directory, there's nothing here that says it's a PNG file. Let's take a look at Detected Easy on this SVG file though. It actually identifies as a PNG file because this has a mask rated extension. So what would actually happen if we rename this from SVG to PNG? Okay, so it looks like there's actually part of a picture. And if we view this, it seems okay, the top part is a picture and then maybe there's some corrupted bytes. And so if we view the file in a hexadecimal editor, we can see a PNG header, we can see reference to IDAT streams. However, we know that there's something hidden here. It's some sort of steganography going on. We have to actually look for an IDAT stream followed by a particular secret key. Now that particular secret key is actually hex value of C6A579EA. And so if we search for this, this is actually following an IDAT stream. So that's actually what we needed. The four bytes following that would be C78E13EF are actually going to be our E to decrypt this payload. So if we open this up in CyberChef, this is an XOR key that's going to be used. We're just gonna throw that in here so we don't forget. And we're gonna get rid of the spaces because we don't need them. So let's just disable this and go back to our hex editor. So everything following though that key all the way down to the bottom, let's take the lock, is going to have this operation where it does a bitwise exclusive or operation on these bytes and transforms them. Once we put that key in and have it from hex first, that we begin to see some characters that are kind of strings that make sense. So let's actually remove our null bytes. We can see stuff like winder syswow 64 cmdexe by the looks of things. There does seem to be this can value thrown in there. But then we can also see what looks to be mshtml.dll as well. And so if I saw something like this and I didn't have any idea of what it was doing, I would lean towards perhaps it's doing some sort of injection just simply because we see mention of syswow64 and the cmd.exe executable. Now we actually know from the Rapid7 report that what this is doing is it's having the command prompt executable load the Microsoft HTML.dll and then what it's doing is it actually rewrites part of the text section of that DLL with the decompressed code and the decrypted code, and then it runs that directly from memory. So it's essentially hollowing out part of that DLL to allow it to run without kind of blowing away the entirety of the DLL, which is kind of interesting the way that that works. 
But if we look further at the decrypted code that we have here, what we could actually do is use something like strings and maybe just crank this up to a minimum length of about seven. And we can begin to see some more strings that might be of interest. So for example, we can see this program to, cannot be run in DOS mode. So there's likely actually a portable executable within the decrypted data that is then going to be loaded into memory. And the fact that this is using combinations of steganography, DLL search order hijacking, encryption, in order to remain undetected is quite interesting. Hi everyone, it's Jai here from the future. So at this point in time, I realized that I go really into the weeds with reverse engineering this malware. And what I'm gonna do is save that for next week's video. So if you got any thoughts, feelings, queries, anything else, leave it in the comments section below and I will catch you next time.